Okay, welcome to Mycroft Developer Sync August 13th. So welcome everybody. So this will be the first of our sort of heterogeneous software meetings where we try to do things a little bit differently during the week than we do on the Monday planning meetings. So uh, the idea here I think is to just discuss issues that we're having, things that we need to coordinate on, uh, and maybe have some discussion around some of the, the bigger topics uh, that have come up uh, before. So I've got a couple of agenda items I'd like to talk about. Um, one of them being this uh, issue that has come up with how do we handle architectural level features or contributions to core that originate in the community. Uh, so I'd like to have a discussion around that. Um, and uh, if there's anything uh, that people have that they'd like to demo, like to demo. hint, hint, uh, Ken, uh, that would be great. Uh, but if not, that's fine. Um, and does anybody else have any other topics that they'd like to discuss? I have uh, something that relates, I think, uh, which is a kind of a large topic. It's more of a cultural or corporate culture topic, but it's going to touch upon the database schema. Um, and so I have that issue. And then I also wanted to talk to you about the pull request and bring that up. I think it might not be a bad idea regarding that for us to put together a periodic pull request committee meeting where these things are discussed amongst ourselves. <laughs> And, um, you know, kind of the, the intent is initially to get through the backlog of pull requests that have been submitted and see which ones, uh, which candidates we might want to promote and which ones we might want not want to and get back to the authors. With the, with the concept being that when people, when, when user contributor or community members are writing code that they'd like to get into our code base, I think this is a golden opportunity. I think we want to keep them motivated and engaged. And I think we owe it to them to get back to them one way or the other in a timely manner and to consider all pull requests. That's not to say all pull requests will blindly make it in. Um, you know, it's just that I think we need to, rather than just paying lip service to it, actually put a stake in the ground and meet maybe monthly uh, and have a pull request committee meeting. Um, that was just my input on that. So that that's that's the first one. Um, if you wanted to follow up on that and go deeper, we could, or I could bring up the issues I have regarding the database schema and how we want to treat samples. Okay, so that sounds like two more topics there, right? The database and then the pull requests are two different issues. Yeah, yeah, two different okay. topics, right? One of them is yours, right? And I also want to, following on from the sample thing, I also want to talk about um, how we're going to store. And my next thing I need to do is write the script that stores the samples on the NAS. So I want to talk through that a little bit. All right. So let me, let's touch upon that real quick. Um, just what I've noticed regarding um, data management, which is where I'm kind of at right now the management of the data once it's available, how it's balanced and how it can be selected and, and uh, classified. And I, I wanted to bring up two points. Um, and I, I just want to bring up one nomenclature issue real quick. There is a difference between automatic and manual classifying or tagging of data. And I was kind of um, looking at the documentation and realizing it can be confusing. So in the in moving forward, if so, if I refer to something as being tagged and I don't explicitly say it, the assumption is that means it was manually classified. And if it's not manually classified, then it's automatically classified by a classifier. So that would be the difference I'm using in nomenclature between tagged, which would be manual, and classified, which would be automatic, because they both ultimately accomplish the same goal. But they are two different attributes, two different sets. And moving forward, I'd like to be able to select them from the database distinctly. So I could say, give me all the data that's been manually tagged versus give me all the data that's been maybe manually and automatically class classified, whatever. I think that's, um, a, but that's that an excellent distinction. And in particular, I think it's important to make that distinction because the classification can always be regenerated, right? But uh, but that's probably not efficient. We'd like to be able to, you know, effectively the the database then ends up as a cache of that information 
and that can be really helpful in terms of using that data uh, or and you know maybe even critical in terms of using that data in how we present it to the users because this classification may end up being fed into the tagging system and the you know the priority system for you know which samples we're asking users to uh, later tag and that sort of thing. So there's going to be some back and forth between those, and I think making that distinction is really important. So that's that's a good call. Um, okay. Uh, so the other the other issue is well, there's two here basically. Um, just wanted to uh, point out, Chris, I, I emailed you uh, a bunch of sample queries that touch upon some of these topics, and I explicitly tried to like in there put manually tagged or manually classified versus automatically. So you could see that I was specifically trying to get at that with some of these issues. Uh, so I sent, uh, the point is I, I emailed Chris a bunch of, here's kind of how I'm going to want to select from that database. Let's make sure we can get there from here. Uh, that being said, uh, just to point out, it's very valuable in data for us to have the concept that was brought forward in the old database, which is the final tag classification, specifically the near wake word classification. And why this is so important is that if I'm training for Hey Mycroft, there's a lot of things that could be not Hey Mycroft, including a locomotive noise, right? But what's really valuable for being not Mycroft are near not wake words, like Hey Minecraft and Hey Microsoft, because that will help the training process um, not pick up false positives because they're near. and Getting that near data is difficult enough. And when we do get it, we definitely need to make sure that the database gives us the ability to say, give me all the not wake words that are near this wake word so that we could have, you know, maybe the new wake word is, I don't know, hey, Jarvis. And so there'd be a lot of near not wake words like jar and this and hey, right? Those are valuable to have. And so the if, if we can distinguish those in the database, that would be a huge win. And then the last Already one, done. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. What's that? Already done. Perfect. And then um, the, I was hoping you would say that. And then the last thing, which is something that, that, uh, there's a, a, uh, yeah, go ahead. There's a, a data type of um, that is wake word um, column uh, that, that is wake word that is yes, no, and almost. So almost would be your near. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I just wanted to point, point this out because it's something I think we've been overlooking for, for a while. I just realized it as well. And it's kind of salient, and I'm not sure how we're going to address it, but it has to do with the concept of a not wake word and what is a not wake word. Um, so right now, I think a flaw in the existing data model that you're migrating, Chris, and I'm sure you won't have this problem, is it says, okay, this is not Hey Mycroft, right? It's not the wake word Hey Mycroft, right? So it's Hey Mycroft is the wake word, and then it's got an indicator that says not wake word. That's wonderful. But notness, <laughs> this is kind of tough, but it's it's salient. Notness is kind of related to the wake word you're saying it's not, because Hey Jarvis is not the wake word Hey Mycroft but it sure as hell is the wake word, hey, Jarvis. And so you don't want to confuse that and you know, say, oh, look, I'm building Jarvis. I've got this. It says it's not the wake word. They kind of meant that was not, hey, Mycroft, but it is, hey, Jarvis, and now it's in my negative data set as a not wake word. Mm -hmm. So the tagging of not wake words, I don't know that I have all the answers. It's just something I want us, I wanted to surface that we could be cognizant of. Yeah. Because one yeah. man's not wake word is another man's wake word. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have some thoughts about that. The uh, it occurred to me that when you were saying, you know, there's multiple different ways for things not to be the wake word. And yeah. it occurred to me that well, it might it be important to us to have uh, to know which not wake word it is. Like, hey, Mycroft. You know, and hey, Microsoft and hey, Minecraft can be can sound similar superficially, but is it important to us to have, you know, a good distribution of hey, Microsoft and hey, Minecraft in our data set, and to know that we have, you know, a certain distribution of those things? So saying that it's almost the wake word is useful in a certain sense, um, but I was thinking that maybe instead of saying what things aren't, what we should just say what things are. And that then as a category, we can say, 
all the samples that are Hey Microsoft, we can just say, oh, all of these sound like, we can associate the categories. The category of Hey Microsoft sounds like Hey Mycroft. And so all the, all the samples in those, uh, those data sets will then be related in that way. And so, you know, we, instead of saying what things aren't, we just say what things are, and then we can relate those categories. That way you can be collecting a data set of, you know, uh, Hey Jar Jarvis and Hey Microsoft and Hey whatever, all at the same time and put them in the right buckets. And, uh, you know, we could be collecting multiple data sets uh, simultaneously and just, you know, creating a lot of positive uh, data that we can use. Um, well, yeah, that's generically. exactly where I was going. So right now, everything so that was created on Hey Mycroft, but the point is very rapidly here, we're going to be moving into the concept of user contributions for other wake words besides Hey Mycroft, and that's where these sorts of classifying issues become more important. Sorry, Josh. Yeah, so I the mute the, the, I mistook the mute and the hang up button. Hey, the uh, the problem with tagging, um, especially false activation data, with what it actually is, is that a lot of times it's unintelligible. So you don't really there's like two conversations going on in the background and you don't really know what the heck triggered the wake word and it's hard to figure out what it is so you know for those utterances it i think that that can hit the nail on the head it really does have to associate its its notness with the with what it is not so yeah you know that that train sound in the background right um you know, we don't have any idea what the sound might actually be, right? It might be a train, it might be an A three eighty, it might be, you know, two thousand seven hundred and fifty tons of of ammonium nitrate. Um, but regardless, you know, we don't have the faintest sniff what it is, but we do know that it inadvertently triggered on whatever the current wake word setting is. So the the so I think Ken really nails it. Um, we we do need to associate the inadvertent activations with the the wake word that they inadvertently activated on now mm -hmm. the one of the cool things though as as we oh okay well then we're beating a dead horse but yes um, we are the one thing i will add is that as that once we add <laughs> once we actually know what it is so if we have a bunch of verified hey jarvis utterances we can absolutely suck those into the hey mycroft training as what hey mycroft is not because we know affirmatively that is a hey Jarvis, and and so every time we get a validated wake word, that becomes a another piece of data we can put into the wrong category for training all of the adjacent models. So I'm a little concerned. Uh, sorry about the dead horse, Chris. The schema, what? how it's written, because all these questions, if you look at the schema, are answered by the schema. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned that we're having these discussions about, you know, what the schema should be when everything that we've asked, we've just talked about is already there. Um, yeah, Chris, I, I agree. Now, what would be good is if you could email me back the queries for those questions I sent you that would demonstrate that, yeah, this is definitively how you would select that set of samples. The only thing that's not in the schema right now is, and I'm not sure off the top of my head, is how would we identify a classification that is manual versus um, automatic? So is like, can pitch, for example, be manually tagged and automatically done? Absolutely. And if so, you know. Okay, I, we... I think I have an answer, but I'm not a five minute expert, but I think we need the concept in the data, data structure of tagging and classifying with them being effectively the same thing, but one represents the automated and one represents the manual and samples well, could even have both. Could you define the agent yeah. that classified, that did the classification? Right, so, yeah, exactly, you know, that's what I was thinking. In one case, it's a user and it's, yes. could, could you define the agent that did the classification? So, in, in, you know, in one case, it's the agent is your class, classifying algorithm and in another case it's a particular user id um and so if at any time we find that the uh, you know an agent whether it's a human or non-human agent um is corrupt in some way we can then find all the samples that they that they tag 
I, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. So what you're saying, to summarize, if I understand it correctly, is can we identify the person who tagged the sample uh, somehow? And maybe even, like Chris likes to do, in the absence of somebody doing that, it would be null, right? Um, yeah, I, I don't like null. I could make a, I could make a, uh, like a, like a type column on the classification table that could be used, you know, tag or classify or whatever or, both, or not. Yeah, yeah. Or both. Yeah, or right. and, and yeah, I, um, I prefer not to have, like we saw, Chris, with nulls, because then you have tough left inner joins that sometimes break and stuff. But if you have to do it that way, that's fine. But yeah, I think where Gez is coming from is important, too, that if we, um, along with the tagging or even the classifying, right, could, could tie it to an entity, then if we had a bad entity, we could recover. Either that entity was a bad auto classifier or a bad actor. So yeah, I yeah. think that's I mean, yeah, I think you should get a count ID, right? That way, right? I thought, yeah. I thought that yeah. we were, we're not just, uh, yeah, I, I thought that the database was designed such that we're logging actual tagging events in, a, in the database, right? We are. Right. Yes. So then as long as we're associating yes, the source of that mean, tag, then I think we've, we're covered. Yeah, I agree. Then we just need to uh, relate, um, and then the, the, uh, you know what the final values are, or what the accepted values are for each. You know, and 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 then the question becomes, what what does final mean? Like, does does final mean final tag, final automated t classification? You know, and you're, you're getting you can get pretty I, muddy well, there. Yeah, I think that's that that'll end up, up being... I didn't have any answers. Yeah, 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 Chris. I, that's I think why that's going to be a derived set of data, right? There's there's the raw set of data, which is going to be you know, the actual inputs that we get from the users or from a classifier. And, uh, but then there's going to be derived data that we use, and that's going to be probably under, you know, constant revision as we fine tune the algorithms for selecting which data we want to use. And as we get more data, you know, how do we integrate that into the system? Like, I think that, I think that the attributes that we care about are going to be constantly evolving. And so they probably, if we need to summarize them in some way and say that, oh, this this particular sample has been classified enough, I think that that belongs in its own space, right? Because that classified enough is going to change over time and what the definition of that is. And maybe we even, I don't know, maybe that's, I don't, uh, I'm just spitballing here, but maybe that um, that might even change with every iteration of the model, right? Well, I, I, all I'm saying is I don't have any easy answers. I just wanted to surface it for Chris V for as food for thought because it's something I think we need to think about, but I don't have an easy answer for you, Chris, on how to structure it. And then just one last thing on the model. I, I tried to show it in those sample queries I gave you. Not all classifications are binary. So, for example, right now, pitch classification is high-low. It, it certainly could morph into high, medium, and low. Other classifications it could have wider ranges. So... I don't know how you're going to structure that either. I, I don't have any easy answers. Right now, they are um, they're they're enumerated data types. Okay. So right now, like uh, is wake word is yes, no, or almost. Um, pitch is high, medium, and low, and we can add to those enumerations or subtract from them however we need to. Yeah, that that sounds about right. And I think once I start, once you have the data ported over, and I start selecting from it, we can talk about some of the queries and understand maybe some things we overlook. I don't necessarily yeah, expect I haven't to get everything the tagging stuff very much. You know, right now I'm just trying to get them all fit the loading part. So I haven't really, you know, dedicated a lot of time to the tagging part, but um, yeah, sure. Understood. Yeah, uh, information from, from, a, from a product standpoint, like what we're actually producing at the end of this, you know, I see a, for each individual piece of data, the ability to surface a web page that shows at the top of the, page the waveform and provides a player so they can play the sound and then below it shows a log of you know everything we know about that piece of data so it showed up here from this user id you know this automated tagging process you know there's a transaction right it it, it touched it and classified it as whatever almost um, that was validated by a you know this user id um, so on and so forth. And so we have basically a transaction history for every single piece of data that we use for the training. Um, and it's all shoved into a database. But if at some future point in time, we want to put a, 
a front end around that. That becomes a, a web page that we can click on any given piece of data and see its history, right? And then on the automated side of things, um, you know, eventually some kind of an administrative construct would be able to go in and say, you know, hey, user number one one four nine three six is a is a, a known bad actor, right? This is somebody who sat their two year old in front of the system and had them randomly click buttons, and so you know their classification data is garbage. You know, we would be able to back out. Like, here are all the pieces of data that this this malicious actor touched, and put them back into the the previous state, right? Like, nuke off the nuke off the tags, and the you know this transaction stuff is actually an internal join, so it's not a particularly complicated data construct it's just you know self-linking right it's all shoved into a single table um yeah from a product perspective a page that shows that the transaction history for that particular sound or data object yeah i don't want to get too too far into tagging right now because i want to finish up the storage stuff and we'll have these discussions all over again when we start talking about tagging and designing that so i'd rather hold off on some of those discussions. I mean, some high level yeah, stuff. No, agreed, I can, Chris. Yeah. Agreed, Chris. The uh, transaction history is wonderful and it could help with debugging, but it sure does sound like a phase two kind of thing, um, you know, for where you're at right now. Uh, but just wanted to, you know, mention that. Just, just like I'm going to be doing a lot of, just to give you a heads up, a lot of uh, group buys and havings uh, because I'm going to start doing selects that limit by the contributor, you know, so no more than, you know, 10 from you know each user and then group by having right so there's gonna be a lot of that just want to make sure we can get there from here that's why i tried to send you some sql queries but yeah you're right some of this stuff is obviously uh phase two from where we're at now okay yeah it sounds like we've got the database structure is adequate for what we need and where we need to go uh there's uh, i think it, it is going to be a separate discussion in terms of the um you know, the, the system that ends up presenting these to the user for tagging and that sort of thing, that's kind of decoupled from the acquisition side. It's a whole it's a whole separate problem to solve and it's going to go hand in hand with the training algorithms and the, you know, sort of the, the research side of things there as well. So, yeah, uh, I, so yeah. I, don't you, I don't know if you saw, but I cut a ticket for that. Gez, I signed it to you. I don't know if you're the right guy for the web page for tagging. Well, I think, I think that we should start that discussion actually with Derek would be my uh my thought it's, it's it's as much of a user experience issue as it is you know uh implementation issue yeah, yeah. So, there yeah, you go so, Derek. <laughs> sorry to sidetrack us on the data issues i just wanted to uh give chris a heads up i didn't want to you know come later and say oh well i need this and not you know try to expose everything but, yeah, yeah and and that's all i had on that other than the pull request committee, that's all I had. Okay, well, let's talk about, uh, Chris has a, an issue with um, deciding how we're physically going to store these uh, samples, right? Is that the question? Yeah, um, yes and no. Um, so yeah, so the next thing I'm gonna do, starting probably right after this meeting, <laughs> is writing a script that's gonna take the, the data that's stored on the API server, the sample files, and getting them onto long-term storage. So um, my current assumptions are that that long-term storage is our um, our NAS in Lawrence. And um, so what I really need to know is, you know, and I have a, there's a directory structure defined in Confluence. I want to make sure everyone's OK with that. Or at least Ken's okay with that, <laughs> um, and then, and um, you know, the, and the file naming convention, so that you know, basically, I want to do this right the first time. Yeah, you um, broke up a little bit there. I couldn't really hear you, but um, I, I was wondering. Last time we had discussed this, you had mentioned maybe we could SCP those files over, but that seems a bit messy. I think what would probably be cleanest is just to have Josh have the guys uh, expose the mount of the NAS to your Selenium server, that would make it easier for you to mic to move them over uh, versus SCPing them to another machine. Is that, does that sound about right? Or do you want to SCP them? Well, the, did, what protocol is my question? I mean, the, well, the, I mean, we can, I guess we could advertise an NFS mount 
like from Lawrence to the digital oceans in New York and probably uh, authenticate it based on like IP address or something, I guess, but it's a, it's not something that would be within the. I mean, SCP uses SSH. SSH is already exposed. Um, on you know, we'd, we'd have to have maybe the persist server over there in Lawrence. We could SSH to something that's already got it mounted. Um, and then yeah, can you, um, you you just it's there's a lot of uh, I mean uh, Ken does have a point. There's a lot of uh, uh, processing overhead with that. But you know, it, it's not we're not dealing with Google levels of data at the moment, right? No, and it's a batch job. So, I mean, performance doesn't really matter. This is going to happen overnight. You know, if it takes an hour, it takes an hour. Um, but yeah, no, Chris, if it, it, I I really don't care. All I was getting at was that if you had a mount exposed, it would make your life a lot easier. But you can certainly accomplish it with SCP. And I forgot and completely overlooked the fact that these servers were not brethren. That some of I guess Selene is running in Digital Oceans Cloud. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, so, all right, well, then, you, you know what's best. So, file system over, over SSH, just F mount and mount it as a local directory, it's not really difficult. I'm sorry, what was that? You broke off there, Jeff. I said you can mount um, file systems over SSH. So, you can actually mount it as a directory with SSH as the underlying protocol, and I mean, I can hook you up with that if you want to. Okay. Yeah, that's Chris's call. He's he's writing the code, but yeah, um, I would think amount would be easier, Chris, but if it's if SCP is easier for you, then, you know, I think you have that already. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, so then, is it okay? Mind if I share my screen real quick and just show you the directory structure that is in Confluence and make sure? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'm just turning off my video because uh, everybody's breaking up to me for some reason. All right. Give me just a second to bring up the document. Okay, can everybody see my uh, Confluence document here? Yes. Yes. All right. So um, I've done the sample collection part. It's ready to go. Um, and this is actually wrong right now. The file name is just account ID dot timestamp because the wake word is going to be the directory. So that's that's wrong. But so. So assuming an account ID dot timestamp dot wave file, this is a directory structure that I was considering. So basically, you have the name of the wake word, um, the whether or not it was classified, um, like classification is complete, and that that's a whole other thing about <laughs> you know what what does it mean if it's classified or not, or um, but. And then well, there's the you, you took me aback um, with just account ID timestamp only because looking forward, people may submit batches of them, and I'm not sure how that's going to play out. But um, yeah, sure. Well, uh, I we, mean, can, we can address that differently later, I guess. Right now, the only way we have, as of right now, the only way we have to collect these is from devices and, and maybe from, from a, uh, from a, a single sign-on supported application. So, so um, what I the only the only thing I would say is that I, I see where you're going with this, and based on our conversation earlier, it's, it's technically correct. All I would point out is that there is certainly a higher value to be placed, in my opinion, on samples that have been manually processed versus not. That to me is a discriminator, a huge discriminator. Um, but I mean, all of that is actually technically available from the database. Um, 
but I do agree that, you know, breaking it out and things that have been classified and things that haven't is a good breakout. And then well, by the wake word, is too. I have a concern actually about that because whether something is classified or unclassified can change over time. And I think that this directory structure shouldn't be dependent on things that can change over time. Mm. But so, a manual processing or manual tagging of a sample cannot change over time, correct? It, well, uh, the tagging itself is an event that, well, you know, we can't erase the event, but we could erase the sample that it applies to. Yes, in which case it wouldn't show up here. And the value of the tagging could change. But the fact that a human had touched it, once that happened, you would think is sticky. So I am wondering, is it, is it worth having classified versus unclassified here? I mean, if we have a, a pointer in a database to the directory this thing is in, we just need to have wake word and then, and then you know, groups of groups of 50,000 or whatever and use a database to figure out what's tagged and what's not rather than the directory structure? It's a slippery slope because it sure did seem like when I was looking at it, I'm not sure the, when you're looking at it, that it was kind of um, assuring that all the new samples we just gathered today are obviously going into the untagged section of the of the of the file system, which is why I didn't break them out at wakeward at the highest level, but just that these have been tagged or manually classified, and these still need attention. Um, and the the group that needs attention, in my estimation, is going to be huge, orders of magnitude larger than the group that's had attention paid to it. And I was just thinking that there might be some value in partitioning the data that way, but. Again, um, it's a slippery slope, Chris. I, I don't know the, the, the right way. And yeah, certainly I, uh, the things Michael pointed out are, are relevant here as well. The, the classifications can change over time. Well, and it may be classified in multiple different ways, right? Like if you're using yeah. a wake word, you know, is it classified with respect to the schema we're using this year? Or is it classified with respect to the schema we're using next year? You know, what yeah. if we, we, in, we change what it means to have a classified sample, you know, we, we change our requirements from must be, uh, you know, uh, tagged in the same way by two different users to must be tagged in the same way by three different users, then suddenly all of our, you know, not necessarily all of our data needs to change. It just depends on how many times it's been tagged. Right. And that's a, that's a database query, not a, uh, not a directory, you know, lookup, I think. Cause yeah, you'd, you'd have to end that. up moving your pointers in your directory around constantly. As we change those definitions, yeah, yeah, um, I know, I know, and and you're right there. Uh, again, to me, it was just has this been touched by a human or not, because that data is more valuable than data that hasn't been. But again, that's information that could be derived technically from the schema. Um, yeah, I just don't know. I'm glad that we're having the discussions because this is kind of where I was stuck like a week or two ago, which is all these data related, you know, or data engineering related questions that I didn't have any easy answers to. And it's, it's refreshing to see that people just don't go, oh, well, stupid, do this. You know, so that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I think that the group, uh, I think just going by, you know, the wake word name, and it's really not wake word name, it's intended wake word name, right? Because it might be, hey, Microsoft. So that's not the actual wake word. Uh, yeah. but it was intended to be associated with the Hey, Mycroft. Yeah, wake word, right? that's the wake word name that was set on the device or was set by the, you know, by whatever. Right. Uh, and then uh, anything, you know, any distinctions or any any kind of optimization we want to make in terms of the directory structure down the road, um, you know, if we start with this, which is the most generic way, then you know, as we run into, you know, I don't know whether it's going to be performance problems or or what, um, you know, this is sort of the simplest uh, starting point, And I think that that'll, um, that'll make sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, it'd be refreshing just to get this data into subdirectories that are smaller than a couple of million entries. Right, I mean, I, I guess, uh, let me see here. You've got the, you've got the, the file name is uh, based on the account ID and timestamp. I mean, that's another thing that won't change, right? The, the file, uh, the account ID is a thing that 
might be useful to group things by. Um, so that's that's something we could consider grouping things by because it looks like you know right now the think the default group one two three through n is going to be based on the timestamp right if we just take the first fifty thousand that the system collects put them into group one the next fifty thousand go into group two then you're de facto sorting by timestamp um, but we could also consider sorting by account ID so that might you know you know I don't know if there's any value to so my initial I see yeah I mean I don't like having arbitrarily named directories necessarily. So I, my initial thought was maybe this should this, this second level should be an account ID or even a date, like the date we got it. Um, then I mean, no, we'd have to have, so the only problem with that would potentially be, you know, scalability if we have, you know, if, we, if things blow up and we have a million people doing things and then this, there's a million accounts here and, <laughs> and then we have the same problem. Um, well, yeah, that's this more generic that's, solution, that's, I think, is more scalable. And I, you know, I do want to have a million people contributing data. I think our collection scheme will change when we have a million people submitting wake words every day, uh, because we won't probably need that much data, right? But, yeah. um, you know, we'll probably go through some sort of automated filtering process where it just checks to see if this contribution has any chance of improving the system and throws it away if it doesn't, you know, but, um, uh, but I think the more generic it is at this level, it's the, probably the more scalable it is. Yeah. Yeah. I would recommend against um, organizing them by account ID subdirectories only because that that in and of itself can become problematic as the account. Grew. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know, Chris. Right. I mean, I'm I'm with you. Uh, just arbitrary hashes on file names don't really bring a lot of value to the equation. So. I don't. I guess the bottom line, Chris, is I'm gonna be comfortable with anything you come up with, and I don't have any easy answers for you. Well, okay. So we're, at some point, we're gonna have to deal with the issue that we may end up with more than fifty thousand directories. You know, if n gets to fifty thousand, now suddenly we're, you know, we're at the n squared problem, right? Uh, so we need to make sure that whatever system we come up with is going to scale in that sense too. You know, we have we already have fifty thousand user accounts. So if we were to sort things by user account, we'd are, we're already hit our limit, right? Um, so we need to think about how this is going to scale with, uh, you know, over time that way as well. If we go by date, well, there's probably, you know, if we get to fifty thousand days in the system, then I think we'll probably be doing really great. But uh, well, we could go date then group. Yeah, that, that might be useful. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think that might be a good way. I mean, maybe we should try that because that way, you know, the, the, having that many groups in one day seems very unlikely, right? <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. 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 And, and oh, by the way, isn't 50,000 times 50,000 something like two and a half gig or something? So it's a, it's a huge number. It is. But, you know, I, mean, I guess eventually we may. Get to the point where more the merrier, and collect as much data as we can. I, I just don't know yet. I don't know. That's one of those hyperparameters that's tough to, to corner. Is one is enough samples enough, and one is it not enough? And I'm still trying to you know answer that as I go through the. Uh... Well, the thing is, for now we're collecting yeah. what, so <laughs> uh, everything yeah. goes in there. Then... Yeah, this at the end of this, we're probably. We're, we're probably going to end up moving into a NoSQL system. When we reach a certain amount of data, it's going to make sense for us to move into Mongo or move into Neo4j or move into Cassandra and and get out of the relational database business because the as the data sets get bigger and bigger and bigger, relational databases just can't handle it. So, um, and this is perfect for something like Mongo. Implementing. Yeah, yes. or I mean, this is. And the thing is, you're absolutely right, Josh, because NoSQL databases um, handle variable or unknown attribute classification layering very easily, um, whereas databases tend to have to be restructured. And if this database is, a, you know, I don't know, a couple of gigabytes of, of samples, just restructuring and re-indexing could take weeks. So, yeah, we, we may get there sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, it would be just the nearest gator to the boat, as they say in Alabama, uh, and, and you know, get the Haymycroft system up and running, get the training system up and running, so that we can 
move forward with actual the thing holding the company back at this point is is you know that eight plus two project we launched you know 14 months ago you know being able to deliver a reliable experience on one smart speaker um you know for just the hey mycroft wake word you know in a way that that is reliable and presentable and you know once we're able to do that a bunch of other doors kick open and then you know Hopefully what we're talking about now is to a specialty developer who specializes in NoSQL databases. Because yeah, we have money to hire the person. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure. Agreed. Okay, so um, let's shift gears then and talk about uh, community contributions uh, to core. I uh, First thing I, I'd like to uh, interject here is that um, I was really excited by this idea of a plugin system where we can have, you know, significant changes to the core uh, that don't have to be, you know, rolled up into the mainline database. So I don't, um, I think, I think that'll be a really significant development um, and allow, you know, people to customize the system in the ways that they want without bloating the, the core. So that's, that's great. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the particulars of how we want to interface with the community, you know, my my background, you know, when I when I started off, it was very hierarchical approach. Like, um, I would sit in my ivory tower and come up with designs and hand them down to the engineering managers, and then they would, you know, uh, we'd work hand in hand with the the actual developers to uh, build out the test system and the and the actual implementation and and verification and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, but information was you know very kind of one way. Um, this is a different uh, environment, and I think in order to continue to reap the benefits of this sort of bi-directional environment, I want to make sure that we don't um, you know lose the agility that comes with that. Um, so while I'm a huge fan of documentation, like it makes me really nervous when I don't have a good spec for something before it starts even getting worked on. Right. Um, I see the value in working with the community in terms of, you know, exploring different ideas and spaces. Um, and so ultimately what I'd like to do is, you know, find some way that we can, um, you know, keep, keep working with the community in this, in this interactive fashion, but ultimately once something does get rolled in, especially into core, um, that we end up with really good documentation for it and that before and even before then that we have some sort of process whereby before too much work gets done on it you know we make sure that we've vetted against our roadmap and our you know what we can see coming um but even given that you know um well we're probably never going to get the perfect solution on the first try and if a user can contribute something to us that's like an 80 percent solution to a problem we have or that's a hundred percent solution to a problem we have right now but is only an 80 percent solution to the big picture problem that we have in six months or or whatever then i don't think that it's you know necessary for us to block that in terms of the perfect solution you know in terms of waiting for the, the biggest solution. problem with that statement is the backwards compatibility issue because we've, we've already been stuck a few times saying, oh, well, we can't do X because it's going to break Y and because Y came before X and, and then, you know, it really it can back into a corner. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'd, I'm all for moving fast and being agile, but if you get too far down somewhere and you decide you want to go a different direction, then you, I mean, you could really, you could really screw yourself. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, no, I get that. And I think that the, um, but you know, on the flip side of that, if if we're not able to do the work that we need to do to solve a particular problem today, but a community member can solve you know most of that problem today, then at some point we're going to have to do that work anyway, right? So if it's a matter of introducing two changes that we have to go back through and do a whole bunch of compatibility fix-ups for, well, you know, I guess we have to weigh the the effort on our part of of doing those fix-ups versus um, the effort of you know engaging with that community member or team of people or whoever uh, to get the solution that we'd prefer the first time around, right? You know, I don't so think it's just the effort of doing the compatibility. I think the more backward compatibility code you put in a system, the more complex it gets. 
So if we find ourselves doing a lot of, you know, you know, workarounds to make things compatible, you know, because we went at it, went at it the wrong way, and there's a lot of this in core right now, actually. <laughs> um, you know, they, and for example, there's two, this upload wake word thing Chris just worked on. There's just two methods in the bike class to upload a wake word. One, one's old. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that happens if you're not careful. Um, and right now it's all over our code base. And, you know, if, if we're not careful, it'll continue to be all over our code base and make it hard to maintain. Yeah, those are all those are all valid points, but I'm looking at it a little bit differently. I'm looking at contributions from the user community as manna from heaven. Um, you know, you can't beat the price. And how do we leverage that starting, you know, huge benefit such that we can we can balance it against kind of what you're speaking to, Chris, but what I would call it is more testability. In other words, we have an existing system, right? We're going to allow a new pull request from the community to come in. And the question is, are our test systems robust enough to know if it broke something or not? And if not, and, and the assumption is that they all never be perfect. If not, is it worth our effort at that point to, to push them to do the testing or to build the testing to protect ourselves from it um, versus rejecting the pull request because it broke something. Um, and my concern is that if we have a really good robust test system, any pull request could be immediately, it could be immediately determined on the, on the merge, which I assume kicks off a, a Jenkins run, uh, whether it broke anything or not. Now, you know, that's not the end all. I mean, there's subtle breakages that slip through the cracks, there's semantic changes, there's all sorts of stuff. And I think what you were speaking to, Chris, was more the cleanliness of the pull request because it carries the existing system's baggage and it has to work within that framework versus restructuring that. And that's why I think it's really important we as a organization address this seriously with a periodic pull request committee meeting that we balance as a team and weigh the ultimate benefit or value of the pull request in our roadmap to the pain threshold. Um, some are going to be no-brainers. Oh, this is way too complicated. It's going to be too much aggravation. We're not going to do it. Some are going to be no-brainers the other way. Oh, this is just a modification of the skills. It gives skills an additional benefit and whatever. But some of them are going to be tricky, like the one we have, uh, we've been discussing kind of uh, back and forth, where it's kind of significant. There's going to be a lot of restructuring, and maybe the design is not compatible or completely compatible to what we have. And again, that's why I keep har harping back to, or harking back to the issue that we, we're trying to balance a thin line here, which is keeping the community engaged and motivated, because nothing's more demotivating than to do a bunch of work and then have it be rejected out of hand, right? I wouldn't want to keep contributing to that. But then the testability of said, you know, uh, enhancements or or additions to the code. And can we protect ourselves from it? Do we have the, ad the means to adequately protect ourselves so we know that we're guaranteed this isn't going to break something? So so that's the balance. And and I think it's it's not a simple yes, no binary kind of answer. I think that's why we need a committee meeting with upper management in there to help us prioritize which of these would deserve our attention. And then as engineers, we can take a look at it and say, well, this is kind of what it's going to cost. And they can use that cost in their, in their determination. So that, that's just my take on it. Uh, again, uh, I want to encourage the community to contribute. The more, the merrier. But how do we manage that process? Yeah, and I can see as our community grows and as our staff grows and our ability to you know, interface with the community uh, increases, then, um, you know, we may end up with, you know, people on staff whose whole job it is, is to take, you know, valuable contributions that we get from the community and basically, you know, refactor them into, uh, the way we see things working down the road. Right. Um, so I, I that, that may end up very well end up being like a, a valuable way to proceed. Um, but, um, you know, I think we need to, lay out the expectations with our community too as to what it is that um you know we expect in terms of contributions right like so we've um 
yeah, I see regular, um, you know, uh, I see pull requests regularly kicked back for things like, oh, hey, you forgot to run basically the lint system on this, right? And if, you know, these these line numbers are too long. It's, you know, it's, it's simple stuff that they can easily fix, right? And uh, as long as the community knows that stuff ahead of time, they can say, oh, yeah, that's my bad, right? Um, and if, you know, if we're going to expect them to write a, a, a robust test suite to go along with their changes, you know, depending on the the uh, extent of their changes, I think it'd be, you know, if we make that known up front, then it's not, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to them if, you know, they make an extensive uh, set of improvements to core, and then we kick it back because although the, the, the changes seem to work, uh, they didn't provide us with, you know, the testing framework that we need to verify that, right? Um, now we may, you know, decide to take that upon ourselves, um, but at least establishing up front with the community what our expectations are for each sort of kind of um, scope of of uh, contribution, I think, will be important. Um, yeah. But I mean, we've been talking a lot mm -hmm. about the abstract here. Um, you know, maybe we could shift into talking about the specifics of this particular contribution, and you know, um, what about the particular pull request that you know we're considering right now is uh not to chris's liking um and you know how can we address that with the community in a timely fashion that's you know uh doesn't make people feel like they're um fighting an uphill battle you know uh and that it's it's that we're working together to to get this thing done yeah but mike the other thing just before we go to that is that um our community of contributors is more of a customer than a vendor relationship. And I think the sword cuts both ways. I think we kind of want to surface at some point or publish um, that we'll, you know, do our best to get back to you on your submission within a reasonable amount of time so that they have that expectation as well, which is why I was saying if the committee meets monthly, we could possibly tell them that we'll get, you know, back to you within 90 days or something, but just because, just to give them a commitment as well, because we want to keep them engaged, we want to keep them motivated, and we don't want to keep them hanging. I suspect we have some pull requests out there for years, and, you know, I don't know of what value a two-year-old pull request is now. So, I mean, if, if it was my pull request from two years ago, and now you want to use it, I'm going to tell you, good, go use it. Don't bother me. I'm busy. You know, I got bigger fish to fry. I moved on. Um, and I'm trying to avoid that. So I think we owe the community also some commitments is all I was getting at. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I don't know that a monthly meeting is the right solution. It might be. I'm not saying it's not. Um, in fact, my first thought was, wow, that seems like a lot of time between, you know, to, to possibly let a lapse, you know, between something being submitted and and then reviewed. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, at this very moment in time, we're a pretty small team. And so that's my you know, concern. We easily we be overwhelmed. Yeah. That's under my concern as well. Well, you know, how does it impact our velocity? You know, in the tasks, tasks that we have prioritized, right. if we're spending, you know, half our day every day examining pull requests or, and going back and forth with some, with community members. Well, I think yeah, if we classify like, them in terms of forward. things that well, I think, yeah, I think if we can classify them in terms of things that are addressing um, current issues of ours that we're working on versus things that are, um, you know, maybe tangential to, to what we want or, or what are critical to us at this moment in time, then I think, you know, we could, uh, you know, at least make it clear to the community that, that we're going to respond to things that are, you know, in our critical path in a timely fashion and things that are not. Um, you know, as, as time permits and, you know, as, as our team grows, you know, I would love to be able to make more firm commitments about those review, uh, you know, that review process. Um, but at this point in time, I don't think we're in a position to, you know, promise anything with respect to, uh, you know, pet features that are not necessarily, you know, going to contribute to getting the Mark II out there, you know, and, and making a great first user experience. So. Yeah, I think we've got to go through a few passes of that sort of stuff. Like, you know, the, there's immediate bug fixes that are, as someone said, like sort of really straightforward, um, and you know, they should be handled quite quickly. And and there are things um, that are addressing current needs, and so we need to handle those in in some time fashion. And then there's there's the like, I want to kind of branch out and do this completely new thing, um, which is cool, but like. 
not really what we're after. Um, but I think ultimately we want to, I think, you know, people that are contributing, they want to, they want to do things that are beneficial for Minecraft as well. And so however we can, um, uh, help people to know what it is that we are working on and, and what our direction is and, um, and how their contribution, um, ties into that, uh, is beneficial. Um, and I think people are, are very happy to get, you know, feedback on, you know, how, um, how they can improve their code. Um, you know, we get a lot of people who are, you know, the entire spectrum of, of, um, development experience. Um, and yeah, how, how we want things structured and people are happy to, to make those changes most of the time. So it's just about, you know, that, that old time factor that we have. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, do we have, um, what in particular is keeping us from um, going ahead and integrating these recent changes uh, that I know uh, Chris wanted to get into um, before our 2008 release? At least that was the initial plan. I don't know if that's still a realistic goal or not. Um, or am I, am I conflating two different issues here? Are you talking about the um, the pull request in question that's been going around, or are you talking about work yeah. that Chris has going on? Because you said no. Chris. I think you misspoke. Oh, uh, I meant Chris Gesling. So. Ah, <laughs> yes. There we go. Well, so there's, well, I think we're talking about two at the moment. There's the plugin system, the um, audio backends, TTS, and STT. Um, and so the benefit... So, you know, I, I think, uh, as you talked about earlier, Michael, like this is a really useful one in terms of stripping out, uh, stuff from core that doesn't really need to be there. So at the moment we have support for a whole range of, of TTS and SDK systems in particular, and then a couple of audio backends. Um, and, you know, the number of users that are using Yandex as their TTS is, is probably fairly small. Um, but it's awesome that Russian users or, you know, users that are served by Yandex can use that. Um, but by having in core, it kind of indicates that A, we're supporting it. Um, and B, it's just extra code that doesn't need to be on every single device, you know. Um, so I guess the benefit of, of trying to get that in before uh, 2008 is that, um, I mean, we want to kind of give it some really solid testing, um, but it means that we can strip out those extra services um, when we do a, a major release. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's not, it's not going to change the world if we have to hold that off until later on, you know. I don't wanna... So in addition to improving the architecture of the system overall, it also addresses a particular problem we're having in terms of the boot sequence, right? Isn't, isn't that, isn't uh, not for the plugin. The, the so that's separate. There's the pri that's the that's the other PR. Yeah. Okay. There's two. There's the plugin system, which is purely about tidying things up and and also making it easier for people to contribute new things. Like we've got a few PRs um, that you know are about adding new TTS services or or modifying existing TTS services but in a very particular way. Like the Insight team, you know, they want to add a particular way of, of um, varying the rate of speech um, in Mimic, and you know, with the plugin system, they can they can fork the Mimic TTS class and then you know use that themselves. Um, and so then the other the other PR is is um, specifically looking at how do we know the state of each of our services and therefore confirm whether or not the system is actually ready or not. And Chris V, I believe you had concerns regarding the status service. Was that what you had surfaced? That there was a status service that we had to develop and perhaps this was not amenable to that or was going to preclude us from doing that? Or what were your concerns there? Yeah, mostly it's architectural. I mean, you know, if we're going to have, what's the bigger picture as far as what do we want to do with, with statuses? 
you know, we talked about in a prior meeting, I believe, having a new service that runs that knows the statuses or can query the statuses of each service and, and act on, you know, on statuses that are, you know, that may not be ideal. And how does that, how would that interact with the work that's been done already, if at all? And maybe they're completely independent things. Maybe this is, you know, and, and maybe what he's got is has a way to interact with it that, that would be fine. I just, we haven't spec'd that out yet or really talked much about it other than conceptually. Um, so that's really my concern is that this, you know, we introduce something like this that that pigeonholes us when we want to do that service and to doing something a certain way. Um, right. So yeah. this, this seems to be one of those cases where even if it doesn't do uh, exactly what we want in the long term, I don't necessarily see that there's any downside to using it to solve you know the problem that it's intending to solve right now. Um, because well, again, it's a backwards compatibility problem, right? So if we implement bus messages and stuff that, that use this, you know, and we want to do something different with that, with the new service, you know, what, how much backwards compatibility, compatibility issues are we going to have if we do that? I mean, we don't really, and this is a more generic thing is, you know, is, you know, without a larger view of how we want things to look going forward, you know, how do we implement little things, little smaller things like this and not back ourselves into a corner? Yeah, uh, I mean, the concern I have there is that we don't want to allow fear of the unknown and what may come in the future to, to keep us mired in quicksand today to a certain extent. Um, if there's something in this particular pull request that we're concerned about, we should call it out address it with the author and, and give them an opportunity to correct it. But if what I'm hearing is it's more, we think we have some other stuff coming down the line and this might not work with it, um, I would really just think we could drive off that bridge when we come to it, no? Well, I, I hear what Chris is saying in terms of, you know, maintaining multiple levels of backwards compatibility. You know, we're talking here about a system that's going to impact the interface between code repositories that are distinct from each other, right? Because we're talking about precise and mimic interfacing with core, if I'm understanding it properly. No, this is currently um, no. in the, all, all the existing services that run as part of core. Currently, yeah, it doesn't, I don't, I don't it doesn't think check on you. Uh, issue, really. Um, uh, it could. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I do believe that the bus approach serves us well in that we have a bus where we can promote new messages and new functionality can latch onto those messages. It doesn't mean the old messages have to go away and the old functionality has to go away. Um, that's why I'm, I'm kind of pushing to say, rather than saying, do we want to allow it in because we have these other issues, why don't we just say, what is it that's precluding us from getting this pull request in there specifically and maybe attack it from that approach? So yeah, so is there anything uh, in this pull request that goes outside of a single repository? No, it's all in core. OK. So that seems to limit the, the danger, uh, in my opinion, uh, because we're not touching any interfaces that go across, you know, different that might, you know, uh, different versions of things that might get out of sync. Um, yeah, and the next question becomes, in core, how confident are we that our existing testing methodology will uh, be able to handle any breakages that this pull request engenders. We'll need to have some more tests probably for this. It's a, it's a new concept. So I don't know if it's behavioral or unit or both, but. Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't saying new tests for this. That comes, that goes without saying. I'm saying how confident are we that our existing systems that could be impacted by this are tested enough to know that they've been impacted by this? No, I mean, Boy Kampf is passing for this, right? Right now? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, so I know that this isn't a complete solution because we've already talked about how the fact that it's sort of, um, you know, it's asymmetrical with, with respect to Pedacious and how it's linked into the system, right? Um, not, not every service is treated 
in the same way. Well, yeah, so I mean, the data is a part of the intent service, which is a part of the um, skill service. So with the skill service being ready, it, it assumes that the predacious is service is ready. And so it's up to the skill service to say, yes, I am ready. Um, so this is, this is more about consolidating, basically purely just asking each of the, the five services. So the bus, voice, uh, audio, skills, and what's the fifth one? Oh, enclosure. Um, asking each of the services, yeah, what their status is. And then it's up to each of those services to actually define, you know, have I started? Am I um, ready? Uh, am I in, it, in an error state? Am I um, shutting down? Uh, yeah, that kind of a thing. So it doesn't actually have an opinionated kind of it doesn't have an opinion on, on, you know, those lower level things. And does this, uh, in your opinion, uh, impact our ability to implement that supervisor service that uh, Chris Vare was talking about um, down the road? Well, it depends on what that service looks like, I think. Um, and that's my point. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do totally get Chris's, Chris's concerns around backup compatibility, um, you know, because there's also going to be um, you know, we have other projects that build on top of Micros, right? And so, so if we go down a particular path, then they're going to say, okay, well, this is the way that I check in with Micros services. And so then if we make a change on that in the future, then it's not just our own code that we need to worry about. It's, you know, the, the businesses that are relying on our platform, um, and, and how they need to modify things. Um, I mean, yeah, so there's, there's a documentation that, that I linked. I'm not sure how many people had a chance to look at it, but um, it's a pretty, I think it's a fairly flexible structure. Um, so I can't, I don't see major problems with an external status service, but, you know, Chris has a lot more experience with, with that sort of stuff than I do. So, um yeah, I don't want to make a final call on <laughs> what that's going to look well, like I I before we kind of back it out. You know? And uh, I just wanted to point out, I, I was pretty deep in the Pedacious um, handoff code with Ake during the first week. It's been a couple of months. But yeah. the consensus was that it's intrinsically broken. It's just wrong. Um, Pedacious is a outlier to the way that that is supposed to work. It kind of works well with skills. And then it goes, oh, but if it's Pedacious, then it's like this exception. And we looked at that, and he said, yeah, I've been wanting to fix that for a long time now. So, um, well, There's a whole separate PR that's like fully refactoring the intent service. But that's another discussion. <laughs> I think that falls under the, I'll get to it when I get to it, PRs. <laughs> I think it is a really good change, though. Like, I've, I've had a, quite a deep look at it. and it, so much clearer. Um, yeah. Okay. And this does. This is the change that does particularly address an issue that we have, right? No, it, I mean yeah. it's a good change. I'm not. I'm not. I'm certainly not dinging the the value of knowing the status of our services and knowing when we're actually ready to go. I think that's a very valuable piece of, of functionality. Um, Again, my, my real, only real concern is how does it fit in with things we know are coming down the pike. And if, you know, in this case, we've gotten far enough, maybe we just go ahead and, 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 and let it go and then we'll figure out how to deal with it later. But I'm just going forward, you know, how do we not get ourselves in this position again? Uh, well, I think to a certain extent, I mean, we'll always have these kinds of things cropping up. I think we'll have an increased capacity to deal with them when we've got a, a larger staff. Um, but there's always going to be issues of, you know, people bringing up, um, you know, potentially major changes that don't quite necessarily fit in with what we're doing, uh, you know, uh, but might. So, you know, it's kind of that's, that's one of the things about this, this sort of creative work is that, you know, we don't know how much work it's going to be until we actually have done it. 
you know, so. Mm. Um, Which is, so I think it comes back to that categorization, like how do we, you know, define what's something that we can handle, you know, as an individual working on the code base um, and what's something that, you know, is larger and, and needs to come to the group. And I, I you know, looking at things like um, Python's whole, you know, pet process, um, you know, we don't want to get, <laughs> we don't want to create too much bureaucracy for the sake of bureaucracy, but I think having a, a clear way that people can pitch changes and, and they're reviewed by the team and the community and, you know, developed um, into a final spec before um, anyone gets too carried away would be beneficial. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, you know, in, in light of the fact that there's no specific objections to the PR, I'm inclined to um, be agreeable towards including it. Um, I think we should clearly lay out what our requirements are in terms of like, you know, documentation and um, and that sort of thing. And even share with, you know, the contributors um, what our current concerns are, right? I think we have, um, uh, you know, but make sure make sure that we have, uh, you know, our, even our, even any vague concerns we have, uh, you know, given the fact that we have certain concepts uh, of what we want to do in the future, and maybe they have good solutions for. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Um, you want to implement some sort of supervisory process down the road? Here's how it would work with this particular system, you know, um, or at least give them the opportunity to to maybe address our concerns. So, um, but you know, as things stand now, uh, it looks like it solves a real problem that we have. And we don't have any uh, specific specific objections to it. So, um, uh, and it's occurring at a time, you know, on one of these boundaries where, you know, twice a year we do afford ourselves the opportunity to make breaking changes to the, you know, to the to the system um, in terms of backwards compatibility. So, you know, uh, it seems to me that the worst case outcome is that well, okay, now we've got to wait till. 2102 to fix this if we don't like it, right? Yeah, I think the change, this change itself shouldn't really break anything, but taking it out. So. Right. Yeah, and exactly. something, maybe a future discussion is, you know, about backwards compatibility and, you know, what things need to be more careful about, you know, what things really are impacted when we talk about backwards compatibility and what things are, you know, like a refactor of a of the intent service, you know, probably isn't gonna, hurt. you know, you wouldn't think would hurt anything, but does it? You know, <laughs> where do we have to be careful? Yeah. About these things? Where don't we? Well, yeah, spe specifically if people are relying on bugs being in the system to work, get their their software <laughs> to work they want it to. I remember having to specifically implement uh, incorrect um, addition in hardware because one company did it and they. And everyone else expected everyone else to do it the same way. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't know. We don't know. I don't know how many people are using, you know, forking it and using it. And... Anyway, that's a different discussion for a different day. But yeah, I'll, it's okay. So I, I haven't even actually reviewed the PR yet. I kind of started to, and then I just came up. So I'll review that today um, or tomorrow and provide some feedback. Yeah. We'll get, we'll yeah. Get so done. I think. We, I think we definitely don't want to put it into 20.2.5. Um, I'm hoping that I can release that today. As, as, as people had a look at their release notes, they're pretty massive. <laughs> well, it's been a while since we've done a release. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the one piece uh, left is the, um, there's a PR on turning off the wake word upload um, where I literally just commented out the code. But it sounds like Chris had a look at it because you saw the, the duplicate method as well. Why, why did you comment it out instead of removing it? Uh, I, I, we can remove, remove it. I, I was just, I put a debug message in there that said, you know, this has been deactivated for 20.2 because we're deprecating the API. Um, it may serve as so, a good placeholder for re implementing it with a new API. Yeah, well, I figured we would uncomment the code and, you know, the configuration file changes and but the code actually stays, will stay the same for the new API, I presume, um, because it is a simple post request. 
Um, but yeah, I can delete code instead. Okay, I mean, if it, yeah, I mean, if the intent was just that I'm going to re well, I'll replace that when I implement the new one, that's fine. We're going to have to put yeah. a call for the new API in there somewhere. And that's probably, that's probably exactly where we'll put it. But you can probably go ahead and get rid of the old one. <laughs> um, the one that's no longer here. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, in the configuration, you mean? Or... Well, I mean, there's two methods in that class, right? They do the same thing, and one, one of them is never not used at all. Oh, yeah. So I deleted the, the duplicate method. Okay. So there is now only one. There's now only one method that uploads <laughs> to the make web. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the one that the one that I thought we should keep, uh, I commented out. Okay. Okay. Then I can just change that to do. Well, one. I commented the logic within the method, so the method still gets called. It logs a debug message to let people oh. know. So it was kind of the principle, I guess, was the least amount of touching as possible. All right. Uh, okay, so um, unless there's any other burning issues, which there shouldn't be at this point, um, we're going to have another meeting tomorrow. So let's uh, let's call it for today, and we can follow up tomorrow with uh, anything else um, that we need to discuss. All right. Sounds good. Including, oh, so I know that we didn't specifically address Ken's suggestion of uh, regular um, PR review meetings. I, I think we should come up with a concrete answer to that. So let's uh, make sure that's our first agenda item for tomorrow. All so right. tomorrow, at five o'clock. Uh, uh, tomorrow at the same time. Yes. And and going forward from this week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at the same time. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize we were going to meet tomorrow too. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. See you later.